because I had been training before and stopped and then started over, there were things that I thought I should have been doing better and didn't. Hi there. You're listening to Whistle Game Martial Arts Radio, episode 472. Today, my guest is Mr. Andrew Adams. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and everything we do here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we're doing, check out whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's the place to find our store. And if you make a purchase in the store, make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on some new sparring gear or maybe a uniform, shirt, something like that. Got all kinds of good stuff over there. Now, this show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website. and That is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you the show twice a week, and our goal here at Whistlekick is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists the world over. If you want to support the work that we're doing, there are a number of ways you can help us. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. Tell a friend about us. Maybe pick up one of our books on Amazon, leave a review, or... Support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $5 a month, you get access to that content. If you've been a fan of the show for a while, there's a good chance that you are in our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. And if you pay attention to what goes on in that group, there's a good chance that today's guest's name rings a bell. Mr. Andrew Adams helps us out back there. He's one of our admins. And he's one of the folks welcoming people into the group. He, along with Stacy, do a great job making sure that all of the amazing people, I think we're close to a thousand people in that group, are on task, on topic, and are talking about what we're doing with this show. Now, the way I first met Mr. Adams is a little bit different, probably different than anyone else I've ever met. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his wanderings through the martial arts and a bunch of other stuff. It was a great conversation. I enjoyed getting to know him better. And I think you'll enjoy this episode as well. Mr. Adams, welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure. It's, you know, I, you were probably the first person that really came to me and said, you know, I want to know how you do what you do with the podcast. And that was the first time we met. <laughs> That's you, true. You're right. You hopped in the car and you drove a bunch of hours and we had coffee. We did. Yeah, it was a, it was a great meeting. Uh, just, you know, hearing, okay. hearing how this whole thing works. That was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, about a year and a half or so, I believe. Yeah. yeah it was, and and it, it's easy to forget that it wasn't that long ago because I feel like I know you. Oh, you know, we've well, had we've had nice. a chance to to chat and train and email and and you help behind the scenes and that's kind of what you're doing today. You're help you're you're helping. You're giving of your time. Well, it's it's I like I said, it's a pleasure to uh, to be a part of this. Uh, not just the interview, but uh, just help out Whistle Kick. Uh, I, I love I love what it, what it is that you do, and I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Well, thank you. And I know we're going to get into everything. I mean, we're we're going to well, maybe not everything. That's probably a little bit too grandiose. We don't, we only have so much time, but we're going to get into a lot of things. Let's get into the most fundamental of things. It's a martial arts show. How'd you start training? Uh, let's see. I was in, I just transferred high schools. I was a freshman in high school. So I must've been 13 or 14. And you know, my mom had been in a, uh, a, a, a bad marriage. And when we got out, uh, we moved to a new school and I said, you know, at 13 years old, I need to be able to protect my mom. That's what, that's really all I was thinking. I want to be able to protect my mom so that she doesn't ever get hurt. And uh, I remember looking in the phone book because they existed back then. And I went to the back of Yellow Pages and I just flipped through, looked at martial arts and there was a local school. I knew nothing about martial arts. I just knew that karate is how you learn to protect people. So uh, I remember, you know, when my mom came home from work, I said, this is what I want to do. And she said, okay. And was, you know, I had never before expressed any interest in it. And 
she, uh, you know, w- w- had me call. She's like, I'm not going to do this for you. If this is what you want to do, you have to take ownership of it. So I called the, the first school that was there and it was just the luck of the draw. The first one was uh, about 10 minutes away and we went to our first class and I just was absolutely hooked. Um, there's no other better word to describe it. I just couldn't get enough. And what was it? What hooked you in? Uh, a lot of it, probably the instructor. Um, he was a, a therapist by trade and did family therapy. And so he, I think he could kind of tell that I was lacking in my life at the time, a bit of a male role model. And he just connected with me in in a way that I don't know some other instructors may have been able to perhaps. Mm. And I just, I would train in as a freshman in high school, I started training four days a week. Uh, You know, for, and for a, you know, a high school kid, that's for me, that was, that's a lot. So, and I was there, you know, training all the way through high school started college and you know whenever i come back from college that's where i would go i would i was always excited to get back to the dojo um and i trained all the way through uh niku so a second second degree just before a couple belts before black belt and then as happens all so often especially when students go off to college i i had to take a break i moved to a new location was in school and couldn't make it back to the dojo because I was too far away and then real life hit. And I think that happens to so many people uh, that I just, I had to take a break for a few years and it wasn't until maybe six or seven years later that I read a statistic that said, and I, I have no idea how true this is. I, I, you know, statistics are what you make of them, I suppose. But I, I read a statistic that 80% of people who make it to Brown belt, never make it the black belt. And I said, I don't want to be that statistic. So I had to get back involved again. I just, I realized after reading that, that I was again, missing something in my life. So I started training again at a new, new school. My initial uh, training was in uh, Gojuru Karate. And the new school that I started training at was in Shotokan. So the instructor, you know, looked at my, you know, my, karate at the time and said, you know, you're, you're, you're good. You know, you're, we're not going to make you go back to white belt. You know, you can stay at Brown belt. And then after about maybe a year or so, he retested me for Brown belt. So I got to stay at my same rank, which was really nice. I appreciated that. And then fast forward, I trained there for 10 plus years, um, ended up getting my third degree black belt and then real life hit again. And I had to move to a new place where there was no local school. And uh, again, something was missing later on in life and I had to come back to it. I just, I can't stay away. How much time had passed when you, when you took that break? Was that like a year or 10 years? Probably five to six years. Okay. Yeah. I think that's important for people to know because the, the difference in putting martial arts down for you know, one period of time versus another can really impact how easy it is to come back. Mm, you know, the longer you, you stop doing something, the harder it is to start doing it again. Was it difficult for you to to pick it back up? Um, yes, but there were extenuating circumstances that made it easier. When I when I stopped a- after college, when I started retraining again, I had another very good friend who had trained at a separate dojo. We knew each each other outside of the dojo. We had met. And in our talkings, he had done the exact same thing that I had. He had gotten to Brown Belt in another school. And I had gotten to Brown Belt in my school. And we both stopped for a number of years. And we both said, we want to do this together. So now, having been friends outside of training, we started training at the same school for the first time together. Mm. And so we had each other to kind of or like of a better word, play with, right? Not, not, you know, train with outside of the dojo a little bit, but when we were in the dojo, it was new and yeah, challenging in terms of we hadn't done it in a long time, but we had each other at least. So that was a huge, huge help coming back into it. Mm. Um, I think if it, it would have been a lot more challenging had I not had a friend there with me, 
what what were you leaning on on him for? And, and maybe I'm being speculative in using that word choice, but I'm guessing. Um, How did you support for, each other? Maybe that's a, a better way or or ease. But you, I think you know where I'm getting at, so I'll let you answer the question <laughs> that I'm I'm trying to ask rather than the one I'm asking. Sure, sure. We were able to. First off, we went to class together. So we had a little bit of prep time before class to talk about whatever you're like, oh, I, you know, I wonder what we're going to do tonight in class and just to get the mind racing with each other. Uh, and then after class, we would have the drive home where we could talk about what we did in class and what we struggled with. And, you know, what I struggled with may have been totally different from what he struggled with. And so I think it helped our progress because we got to see what the other person did or didn't do well and got to feel if it had been just myself, I would have been driving home saying, Oh, I didn't do this well. And I felt really bad that I should have picked this up easier. But instead I drove home and said all of those things, but I listened to someone else who had difficulty with this other thing that I did really well. And it made me feel better. Like, Oh, well he struggled with that. I, I actually did pretty well with that. But this other thing he did really well. Man, I had a really hard time with that. So I think just being able to have a closer interaction with another student and be able to discuss what we did and didn't do, I think helped how I felt after class. And you don't always get that when you're the only, when you go home and you have no one else to talk to about it. Or maybe you have a significant other to talk to about it, but they don't really understand because they weren't there. Mm. And I think you've kind of hit on something, something that most of us really don't get the opportunity to do. Yeah, a lot of us start training with a friend, but I've seen this happen enough times that one of those people eventually falls off and the other one sticks around because it's become part of their lives and they really enjoy it, you know, et cetera, whatever their reasons are. Sure. But they lose that sounding board. And that sounding board is so critical. It, I'm pretty lucky. I have, I have a really large sounding board. I get to share things with everyone who listens to the show and I get feedback, you know, just bombarding my email. And it's, it's really helpful to have that support. And you're illustrating the same thing. Do you think you would have continued had you not I, had him? I don't know that I would have. I, I may have continued, but I don't think I would have continued for as long as I did. I, I think I would have probably stuck it out, but I don't think my heart would have been in it as much. That's my guess. I mean, it's hard to speculate because, of course, I had him there. Um, but he did. He he did end up not like we tested for our showdown together. He stayed long enough for that. And then after, as often happens, when people get their black belt, they think, oh, it's over. I'm done. I don't have to train anymore. And that kind of happened with him. And he stopped training. And I kept going. And, you know, three years later, got my second degree black belt. Three years after that, got my third degree black belt. So, he, you know, he did die off and fall off and stop going and i did stick with it but in that initial coming back to the dojo i i don't know if i would have stuck with it it was it was so good to have that connection with someone else and it's different i think if i had been a white belt going to class everything would have been you know difficult and uh, you know people struggle with that and have their own struggles but because i had been training before and stopped and then started over there were things that I thought I should have been doing better and didn't. And I think that's where having the support of someone else really, really helped. I get it. Totally get it. So let's go back. Let's look at this spectrum of your martial arts training or, or timeline. It's a better word. You start training pretty young for a, a really mature reason, a reason that I, I don't know that even the majority of us are fully going to be able to grasp. I'm, I'm I've got some hints of it up to today. Sure. I'm going to assume that your reasons for training now are different than they were when you were 13. Yep, that I would agree. <laughs> How has that changed and why has that changed? Take us on a, on a little bit of a ride inside your mind, if you will. Sure. Well, like, you know, when I was a young kid, it was to protect my mom, you know, and, and I had an, an older brother, but he, he wasn't involved. You know, he was off at college, so wasn't around. So, you know, when I first trained, it was to protect my mom. When I graduated, you know, went off to college and started retraining again, it was because, um, 
I think a part of it was pride. I don't want to be this statistic. I don't, I don't want to be the brown belt that quit because uh, I'm not a quitter. I'm going to keep going. So I started retraining for that reason. Um, and after I got my third degree black belt, I got married and I moved away. And again, took another six or seven year break and started retraining again about three years ago. And now my, your, my reasons for training are completely different. It's health oriented. It's uh, keeping my body in shape. I'm getting older and you know my muscles ache in ways that they didn't when I was younger. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. The, the reasons for, for training change, you know, I think, through a person's career often. Um, and I would be surprised if, you know, what the reasons people started training in the beginning are why they're training now. So uh, that, I think that's the journey for me, you know, initially for protection and then because I don't want to be a quitter. Mm. Uh, and, and then now it's just for me, it's, it's not for anybody else, but me and my body and keeping my, myself active, I think is my main reason for continuing to, to train now. Mm. And I wanted to highlight that. Because I, I had a feeling of the answer, and I was pretty sure where you were going to go with that. Our reasons should change, I think, for our training. Because if, if they don't, it means you're in the same place. It means your challenges are the same, your successes are the same, you're, you're in the same place as a person. And if martial arts is this great tool for personal development, then that shouldn't be the case. Right? Absolutely. So I think the ma majority of people, I'm hoping most of the people out there listening, if you've been training for a while, you know, I'll let you define that however you want. I bet if you take stock of why you're training now versus why you started training, it's changed. I hope it's changed because it means you've changed. Sure. Well, and, and it's interesting because, you know, martial arts is something that is life. It can be life fulfilling and life enriching, right? I mean, that's the, that's for me, that's the goal. And, you know, at a time you know, when, I mean, I can only really speak to karate because I have, you know, extensive training in Gojuru, Shotokan, and now Shorinru, but it's all, it's all, you know, karate based. It's, you know, nothing else really. Um, but if you look at all of the major uh, founders of, of those styles of martial arts and, and even, uh, you know, uh, Jigoro Kano and Hueshiba and, you know, some of the other uh, Aikido and Judo guys, the life expectancy back then was at the average life expectancy was 40 years old. And, you know, Funakoshi died at 88 and, you know, Anku Watosu was 83 and, uh, you know, Sohan Matsumura was 80. I mean, it was unheard of to have people live that long. So it has to fulfill your and enrich your life in a way that surprisingly other things don't apparently have the ability to do. So I, I think that's pretty amazing. And I think it's one of the few, activities that you can do at five you can do at 50 and you can do at 90 everybody finds their own thing from it you know what the person at 90 is getting out of it is different from the person who's five but they're going to be able to do it for their entire life and there aren't a lot of hobbies that you can say that about it's a great point i mean you can certainly you know play with trucks when you're 90 years old but are you going to get as much out of it? You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean it's going to be as beneficial. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know that I've ever thought of it that way. I like that. Nice. And, and the, the, there are, I mean, there are so many different styles of martial art. You know, you don't typically get, uh, and obviously there are you know, exceptions to every rule, but you're not going to find often a 22-year-old you know, guy getting involved in Tai Chi. And you're not going to find 60-year-old guys getting involved in MMA. Right. There may be exceptions, but as a general rule, I think that's fairly, fairly correct. I would agree. But regardless of what age you are, there's something for you. Yeah. So I want you to think back to your, your time, your training, and the stories that come from it. You know I love stories. Everybody who listens to the show know I love stories. And it, to me, this is the driver of everything that we do, not just in the show and in whistle cake, but in martial arts, it's the telling of the stories. So this is your chance to tell your favorite story. You know, leave us, leave us with something, you know, you're, you're stepping up in front of a, a room and you're asked to present your favorite story from your martial arts training. What is that? Or, uh, I have, uh, <laughs> a 
a pretty funny, uh, I have a two stories actually I'd like to share. Uh, sure. One is funny and one is a little more touching. Uh, the the f- funny one, I spent three and a half months in Japan. Uh, I was hired to perform at a theme park in Japan, which is a pretty unique opportunity to be sure. Um, I would do four to five shows a day at a theme park uh, with a mu- musical group that I was performing with. And I had one day off a week. So I you know, worked six days and I had one, everybody in the group had one day off and we had an interpreter that worked for us while we were there for the three and a half months. None of us spoke Japanese, although I knew a little bit through my you know, martial arts training, but not enough, not con- conversationally. And while I was there, I said, you know what? I would love to train in Japan. And it was actually in one of my breaks, but I you know, still had my gi and I still had my belt. And I said, when I'm in Japan, I have to try and train. You know, for, for me, it would have been the, like the, one of the highlights of the trip. So I brought my gi with me. And once we got settled, the first after the first three weeks or so, I went to our interpreter. Uh, his name was Yoshi. And I said, Yoshi, I want to train in martial arts when I'm here. I don't care what martial art it is. I just want to be able to, to, to do it to, to, while I'm over here. And he said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll find a place. I'll find a place. And so he made some calls around and he came back and said, all right, so, you know, on, on your day off, there's this school, um, you know, here's how to get there. You get on the train. And, and I said, okay, so I, that's what I'm going to do. So that morning I got up and, you know, my heart's racing. I'm all excited. I, I get on the train. I got my gi in my bag and I, I planned ahead of time by having my iPad. So I didn't have a, I didn't, it was far long enough ago that I didn't have a smartphone. So I didn't have any, and we, you know, my phone wouldn't have worked there anyway. So I brought my iPad, which has an app to translate things. And because I didn't, I wouldn't have wireless internet while I was there. I programmed ahead of time, some, some phrases, like I would like to train and, you know, can I speak with your sensei and these other things and programmed them all in ahead of time for phrases I thought I might need. And, uh, I, I get to the location, I get there early and I, I'm looking in the, like, I couldn't figure out how to get in the building, but I saw some stairs in the back and I went up the stairs and there's a big window and I look in and I see the dojo and I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. And so I sit there and I wait, and I wait and I wait and I wait. And sure enough, eventually a couple of kids come in or, uh, into the dojo, but not through the door that I was sitting in front of in the, in the back. And they looked at me and I waved at them and they, they came over and, and opened the door and I, I grabbed my iPad and I, I pointed to the phrase, like, I would like to train today. And they motioned like, oh, you're in the wrong spot. And so I went around, I finally found the right door. And so I came in and, you know, they didn't quite understand exactly what was going on. And so I waited some more and some more people started showing up. I was like, okay, great. This is great. And then I realized every single person coming in is a child. There are no, the only adults are the parents that are dropping children off. But I'm like, well, eventually I'm going to find an, you know, there's going to be an adult instructor coming in. And no adult instructor came in. They started teaching and the class was being taught by a 12 year old boy. And finally, one of the parents came over and he had his phone, was using an app to translate his Japanese to English. And I realized how poorly those apps actually work. And I'm trying to talk to him through my app, translating my English to Japanese. And it's just not working. So I finally, uh, one of them called a friend who spoke English and gave the phone to me. And I could say who I was and what I'm trying to do and then gave the phone back to him and he listened to his friend, you know, translating back to Japanese and come to find out this class is only for kids. And the, the interpreter that works for me had no idea. And he sent me to a kid's class of 12 and under. Okay. And I was like, I was mortified. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to sit in on this kid's class. And so I left and never came back. I, j- I was just too embarrassed to come back and 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 i just told the interpreter that works for me i said i i'm done i forget it it didn't work out i can't handle this 
and I never got to train in Japan. Oh, no. I was so close, but yet so far away. I can relate to that. I know, I know how embarrassing that can be. You get up all the nerve that you have to go somewhere in another country, foreign language, because you're just hoping to find this thing and so close, but yet not. Yeah, yeah. Very embarrassed. Very embarrassed. The other story, which which I thought was 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 definitely a little more touching and and uh, not quite as humorous. When I started training most recently, I came into the school, and the instructor said, "You are a black belt. You have a third degree black belt in Shotokan. Your karate is strong. I'm not going to take your belt away from you. You you earned that black belt. You should keep your black belt and wear it in in the class." And I you know I appreciated that I I you know, told them I'm happy to go back to white belt. I didn't, I didn't really care because I wasn't training for belts. I'm training for myself. And he said, no, 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 keep your black belt. And so for the first three, four months or so, I'm, you know, wearing my black belt, which has my name on it, it says Shotokan on one side. And the next test was coming up in the school for, for you know, under ranks. And he had me sit up on the black belt board with everybody else, which was nice. I didn't, didn't expect it, but I appreciated it. We went through the whole test and test is all over and we're all standing uh, at attention and he goes through all the students that were getting their belts. And at the end, he said, there's one person here that uh, I have yet to call up and I'm standing up there and you know, everyone else he's already called up. And he asked me to come up in front and stand in, in front of him. I was like, well, okay, no idea why. And he gave a little bit of a speech about who I was that, you know, why I wear a black belt, because some of the students were kids and they didn't, the kids in the kids class didn't see me, only the adults. So he explained, you know, Andrew has his black belt from his old school and, you know, we let him wear it here because it's, you know, he's a black belt. Uh, So I don't want anyone to think that this is a promotion. I am not promoting Andrew to black belt because he's already a black belt, but I would like you, Andrew, to take your belt off. And so I took my belt off and he gave me a plain black belt, just regular, didn't say anything, just plain black belt. And he asked if I would be willing to wear this belt in the school. And I said, of course. And again, he stressed, it's not a promotion. And I was like, oh, which is fine. And then he pulled out green tape and put a green stripe around the end of my black belt and said, this is a promotion. I'm promoting Andrew to green belt in our school. So I was still a black belt, but officially in the school, I was a green belt. But I was to be treated like a black belt because I earned a black belt. But I was I was just touched. I thought it was a great way to allow someone to come into a school and continue to keep their black belt, be treated like a black belt, but still go through the testing process. And since being in the school, he then, my next test was, I went straight from green to brown belt for EQ. And then my next test was for Shodan in that school. I've heard of a number of different ways that instructors will handle someone with previous rank. I've experienced a number of different ways. That's probably the coolest way I've seen, heard of rather. That's really neat. I, I thought it was really nice because he, you know, he didn't want to take anything away from me with my previous training. And he, he felt it appropriate that the students treat me like a black belt, though technically in the school, I wasn't at that particular school. In, Cause it was a different system. I, my black belt was in Shotokan and this is a Shoran Ru school. And, and that's a school that I train at now. And when I got my Brown belt in the school, he just put Brown tape on the end of my black belt. And then when I tested for a black belt, I got a new black belt. I really like that. It sounds like a pretty good school. Sounds like you well, found a good home there. I'm very, very happy. Now, being someone that's trained in two other schools, I imagine that you were evaluating this third school before you committed to it. Yes. Are, are you willing to talk about that at all? Sure, sure. Um, the My first school was a very traditional dojo. Uh, you know, tatami mats, showmen, bowing in, everything very, very traditional. Uh, the class was taught 90% in Japanese. Um, you know, we, we didn't say front stance. We said Zen Kutsudachi. That's just, that's the whole class. That's what you learn. Um, didn't go to a lot of tournaments, a couple, um, but not, we weren't a big tournament school. 
Um, and then when I took a break and went to my second school, very different. Um, sport karate oriented. We sparred in class every single night. Um, did some board breaking. Didn't, again, a, a handful of tournaments, but not a lot, but a lot more focus on learning kata and less about practical application technique. And the school that I'm at now, very, very traditional oriented school, again, teaches in Japanese, um, a lot more practical applications of things, less focus on uh, learning lots of kata and instead learning more practical things. Um, but it, for me, it was an important to find a traditional school. That, that, that's what resonates to me, you know, understanding the culture, uh, understanding the language as much as possible. I mean, we don't, you know, converse in Japanese in the class, but it's still taught in Japanese. And, and to me, that's really important. Um, not to take anything away from schools that don't do that, but for me, that was the right fit. And I think it's really important to realize what is and isn't a good fit. You know, I, I've trained at schools that weren't the right fit. And sure. I've trained at schools that were for some reasons, but not others. And it comes down to the why, you know, what matters, what matters to you. And, you know, I've trained at schools that vary in formality. I've been with schools that were too formal and it just, and I didn't feel like my personality existed anymore. I felt stifled. And I've trained at schools where I felt like I was in a daycare full of adults <laughs> just doing <laughs> their own thing. Yeah, I, I, I've always felt that there's, there's no such thing as a bad school per se. It's, there may be a bad school for me, mm. but if that school has students in it, if those students are happy with what they're learning, then good for them. Those students will probably not be happy at the school that I'm training at. So, you know, it, what, it, what one man loves, one man may not. And that's okay. And this is one of the beauties of having a number of different martial arts taught by a number of different people in a whole bunch of different ways. Absolutely. That everybody gets a chance to find what works for them. And to me, the sad thing is someone who tries one way with one instructor and doesn't find a fit and gives up. Exactly. One of the things that uh, the sec when I took my first break and started training at my second school. One of the things that I loved about the school is my first initial interaction with the instructor. He said, come on in and check out a class or two. If it's not your cup of tea, that's totally fine. I'm happy to point you at the, you know, another instructor that may be more fitting to what you're looking for. And I think as an instructor to be able to have that um, humility enough to be able to say, my style of teaching might not fit what you're looking for, and that's okay. I'm happy to show you someone else that may fit what you're looking for. And I think as an instructor, be able to have that wherewithal is, is important. Now, martial arts is clearly part of your life, a big part of your life, something that you are passionate about. But I know it's not the only thing you're passionate about. And there's another aspect to your life that I know a little bit about. And I've got a feeling that the two have some synergy. So I'm wondering if you might tell us about drumming. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I left uh, a regular day job a number of years ago to focus on my passion, my other passion, which is teaching drumming, specifically a niche style of drumming, which is drumming for bagpipe bands. Um, when you see a, a bagpipe band walk down the street, they're going to have bagpipers, but they're also going to have drummers. And uh, that's what I do. I teach those drummers. Um, and there is a, a I'm, I'm surprised the more and more I'm involved in the bagpipe band community, how many musicians, specifically pipers and drummers, are involved in martial arts, more so than any other group I've been involved with. Um, you know, when I, you know, if, if on a basketball team, if I were to, to interview all, everyone on the team and find out how many of these adults play, you know, were involved in basketball and martial arts, it would be a pretty low number as opposed to musicians are often, in my experience, often involved in martial arts. And I find that interesting. And I think it has something to do with uh, something to do with the 
pre like with kata pre-range motions and muscle memory of doing things and it's the same with music you know the muscle memory of holding your fingers this way on a guitar to do, do a specific chord and I, i'm just speculating here but i think it has something to do with that okay yeah and this is your full-time job teaching it's my full-time job Te- i teach I, I get hired by groups uh, all over mostly new england um, I do have a, a few groups uh, outside of New England in, uh, in Canada. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police Pipe Band hire me to, to travel up to Montreal and teach them. But I also get hired by you know a lot of students all over the United States to teach lessons over Skype. One of the beauties of modern technology is that I can sit at my computer in my home and I can have a student in Seattle, Washington, sit at their computer and we can see each other. And I can give a drum lesson over the computer, hmm. something that you couldn't do 15 years ago. No, no. And I think the thing that blows me away in a good way that I love is there are people out there who say, oh, that's, that's too specific. There aren't enough people who will want that business. It won't work. And I think you are a perfect example of a very niche thing and turning it into a job. And through that, being able to, to make your living doing something you love. I do. You're right. I do love it. Uh, I I often tell people, uh, in fact, Jeremy, I have to tell you, you say often on your show that you have the best job in the world, but you're lying because I have the best (laughs) job in the world because I get to teach drumming all day. That's pretty cool. (laughs) It really is. Um, Logically, I might be able to one up you because I get to hear about you talking about your job. So we we might be able to diagram that out in a way that I win. (laughs) I don't know. I'm, I'm reflecting back on some college level uh, logic notation. <laughs> Fair enough. But it's too rusty. I don't know if I could diagram that. Let's talk about the synergy between drumming or rhythm and martial arts. Because it's in there and it's not something that's often discussed. Maybe, sure. maybe you can talk about where drumming came in for you, you know, when you started that and how maybe martial arts impacted drumming and drumming impacted martial arts. Sure. I- uh, for me, I started drumming in high school, um, right around, for me, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about this, but right around the same time I started martial arts, actually, uh, had transferred to a new school, didn't know anybody. And, uh, for me, um, I had a, an older brother that passed away when I was very young and I didn't really know him very well because I was four or five or six and I was really little and he had moved uh, when my dad left my mom, he'd gone with my dad. So I didn't really know my brother really well, but I knew that he played snare drum in a bagpipe band. That much I knew. And so when the band director at school said, we need drummers in the band, I thought, oh, great. This is an opportunity for me to A, try something new and B, do something my brother did. Even though I didn't know my brother really well, I feel like this will bring me closer to him. And so I started drumming in high school for for that reason, primarily. And uh, it became something that I just loved, much like martial arts. And I think for me, it may very well have been because they started the same time. And it was, you know, I started for a very emotional reason. Uh, That might be one of the reasons why I became so passionate about it. But in terms of how does it affect my martial arts? for me, the thing that I love is kata. I love doing forms. And you can see the same form done even in the same school by different students, and it will look slightly different because of the cadence or the rhythm of how they do it. And I think for me, seeing how the kata is done, and for me, when I perform a, a, a kata and go through the motions, um, you know, not just in my head going through the motions, you know, thinking about what the, the move is, but changing up the rhythm and the cadence of the form can change the form dramatically. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I'm going to guess that as a percussionist, your ability to make slight variations in that cadence is probably better than the, the average person. You know, I, I know whenever, not that anybody does, seems to do this anymore, but back when Guitar Hero and Rock Band were video games that, that people were playing, 
I would do fine on on guitar. I would do fine on bass guitar. But the moment I I picked up those drumsticks, even putting it on the easiest level, didn't work well for me. <laughs> I well, I don't I don't do well with that rhythm. Somehow I can find it in a form, but I'm guessing part of why you love kata is that you're able to explore it in a way that most of us can't. Maybe, perhaps. I mean, I also think it helps in other ways too that, that I hadn't necessarily thought of, but um, I believe it was uh, Musashi who said there are, there are three times when you can attack your opponent right before they attack, right exactly at the same time, and right after they attack. And for me, I think perhaps I'm able to gauge that before and after rhythmic wise a little differently than other people can has now i would imagine as much time as you've spent in martial arts you're doing at least some level of instruction you know in in a supporting role at, at the very least does your ability to teach drumming come into play are you doing anything differently maybe drills that the rest of us might look at and say what is he doing uh i don't know you're right i do teach uh in the school that i'm at and uh my last school, you know, the instructor, when I got my, my Sandan, my third degree black belt did give me the title of sensei. I don't use it because I'm not a sensei in the school that I'm in now, but I, but in my school currently, I do uh, a, a fair bit of teaching uh, for the sensei when he's, uh, when he's away and, and help him out in class. And I don't know that my drills are per se different because of my drumming. But I will say if there's one thing I've learned in my you know, years and years of teaching drumming is that what works for teaching one student a particular movement might not work teaching this other student. And so one of the things I've learned in my many years of teaching is different ways of teaching the same thing so that if this thing doesn't work with this student. Well, let me try this other way because it worked for this other person over here. And I find myself using those same types of teaching methods when I teach karate as well. I want th this outcome. This is what I want, but I know of a few different ways to get there. So what way is going to work for this particular student? And I think as an instructor, being able to quickly find what does and doesn't work with students is crucial. And so my many years of teaching drumming has helped me teach karate for that reason. Now, way back at the top of the episode, you talked about protecting your mother as the initial motivation for your training. What have her thoughts been have you, as you've stepped in and out and back in to martial arts? I don't know. I, I, it's not something I've talked with her a ton about. I mean, she continued to support you know, when I was in high school, she's the one that brought me to, to class every single day that I went. And, you know, when I got to college, um, she was less involved because I could drive myself, but she's always been there. Uh, and when I moved, you know, a few hours away and, and started training again and eventually getting my second and third degree black belt, she was there at those tests. You know, she, as, you know, as, as an you know, older woman in, you know, in her sixties would, 60s and 70s would drive the two and a half hours and come to my test, which was which was pretty cool. I, I, I certainly appreciated that. We haven't talked specifically about much of my martial arts training since then, but you know, she's still here and she still supports me. And so I appreciate that. I would encourage you to talk to her. I don't know why. I just some something in my gut tells me there's a conversation there that she might enjoy hearing. Did you ever tell her you're you're the impetus? I don't, I, you know what? I don't know that I have, Jeremy. Mm. Well, maybe she, she'll listen to this. Because I can't imagine there's a, a mom out there that wouldn't be touched to hear that story. Sure. About her child. Yeah. When you take a look back, I mean, much of what we've talked about today has been, you know, looking at your training in these, these sections, these segments. And through that, you know, we have, what is it, three really clearly defined periods of time. And each one of those has a certain instructor and maybe the theme or where you were at in life was a little bit different for each one, but they clearly thread together and build on each other. 
but you talk about your training and it sounds like you see your training as this kind of broader you training karate you don't train in shornro it sounds like you see it in a wider perspective am i reading that right yeah no you're absolutely correct um you know the the style quote unquote and i hate that term but you know the the dojo i train in now is shornro but there's so many similarities between all the styles of karate that it, it's it's really hard to say style even is that a perspective that your fellow students in the school or your instructor share? My instructor, for sure. I mean, it, it, I think when you get to, you know, when you get to the level of, an, of being an instructor, uh, it's hard to not see those similarities. Um, I, I can't speak for the other students in the school. Um, you know, I think the advanced students for sure understand that concept. Um, and see the the similarities, and and I think perhaps they even see it a little more now that I've come into the school and have an outside perspective. Whereas for them, for most of them anyway, all they know is the dojo that they're in. But because I come in with knowledge of other styles, and you know, and it's interesting because uh, in the whole grand scheme of things, Gojuru is on one end, Shotokan's kind of on the other, and Shorinru in my view, is very much kind of between the two. So it's been interesting uh, training in these three styles and seeing the dichotomy between all of them. We've talked about training philosophy and, you know, we, we detoured a little bit to talk about music. Now, I have no idea, but I'm going to guess that martial arts, we'll say entertainment, is something that resonates for you. Am I, am I on or am I way off? I would actually say you're way off okay. to a degree. All right. To, I, well, to a degree. What, what do you mean? So I am not a fan of, and not to say that I hate it, but I'm just, it's not my cup of tea, uh, tournament style tricking mm. or the flashy types of kata that, it, you know, that is popular with a lot of people these days, but I enjoy the entertainment style of martial arts in terms of movies and things of, of that nature. Whereas to me, it's, it's fantasy. It, it doesn't have to you know be real for some reason. When I see the tricking type stuff, it, it's not as applicable to real life, which is what I appreciate about the martial arts. If that makes sense it, at all. It does. And it's funny that that's kind of where, where you went with the question. Cause I actually meant more, the movies stuff, but let, Good. I mean, that we just, we okay. opened something up. So let's, let's explore it for a moment. Um, you brought up the idea of, of, of practicality or realism as being something that you value. So how does that impact your training? Well, I want to make sure that in the training that I do, that even though I'm training for myself and my health and my well being, that it, that what I'm learning is still applicable in the real world you know I, I i love to watch the videos and instruction instruction from people like ian abernathy for for example um his stuff is very very street i don't want to say street oriented but like real life this is how it would work and you know and i and i got an opportunity to work with uh sensei abernathy a couple of times and it was phenomenal but when i see lots of jumps and spins in the air and you know taking your bow staff and spinning it up in the air so it's twirling around it's very very impressive but to me would you ever really do that in a fight and so for me the answer would be no and so i don't enjoy that aspect of the martial arts which is very popular i mean if you go to tournaments these days you will see that type of stuff it's just not for me and i i i hear you so then let's talk about the movies. Do you have a favorite martial arts film? Oh, gosh. I worked in, co in college. I worked in a movie theater, uh, in a um, video store. Those used to exist back in the day. <laughs> I did and, as well. And, was it a blockbuster? And, no, it wasn't a oh. blockbuster. It was more of a local, local chain. But I, I often told people, you're not allowed to ask me what's my favorite movie if you work in a movie store. But I do... Um, I loved... 
when I was in high school watching the Van Damme movies, you know, the, the, uh, the Bruce Lee movies. Um, and and we, when I was in high school, we would have, my friends would come over and we would have cheesy ninja night and we would get, I'd rent like three really bad cheesy ninja movies and we would just sit down and watch them all and oh, throughout the night. And we would do like a body count of any time someone we thought died, we would like yell and scream like, oh, we're up to five people now, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I watched everything you could get your hands on. That sounds like a good time. That was a lot of fun, for sure. Nice. And were you continuing to watch movies while you weren't training? Yes. Hmm. I, I, yeah. How did I that make you feel? I don't nostalgic. I think at the time I was like, wow, you know, I used to do this, but I also recognize that this is a movie, you know, it's, this isn't real. I think I would have felt totally different if I had like, if I'd been walking past the dojo and and I did see a couple of times this happened, I'd be walking in, you know, wherever, you know, visiting someone in another town and be walking downtown and I would see a a, a dojo on the street corner and I'd be like, ah, I really missed that. And I, I for sure missed it. And it, it, my life didn't feel complete in those two breaks that I took of the, you know, four or five, six years or whatever. Yeah. I can, I can relate to that a bit. If you could train with anybody anywhere in time, anywhere living dead, any style, I mean, you've named some, some big names. So I actually, I usually have an idea where someone's going to go with this one, but I have no idea for you. Who would you want to train with? Mm, for me, it would probably be uh, Itosu. Mm. He he was for you know, for the karate lineage. He's kind of up there, and you know a, a lot of the the fathers of different styles. You know, Funakoshi and Miyagi. They all studied with him. I would I would like to see where where his head was at karate wise. Great choice. Yeah, somebody who I continue to learn about and am increasingly fascinated with. Because it's a name that most people don't know. And it it's become glaring to me that it's a name we should know. I would agree. Let's look forward. When you look out into your future and how martial arts fits into it, what does it look like? I would say much the same as it does today. I'm just going to continue to train. Uh, I I don't train for belts. I train for me. Um, you know, in my Shotokan school, the uh, instructor was a fourth Don. And so he tested me for third and said, I can't take you any further. And I said, I don't care. I'll keep training. And uh, the only reason I left is because we moved away. The, you know, the current school that I'm training at, I just got my show on. I mean, my next belt would be knee on, but I don't care. I mean, if I, if, and when I get it great, but you know, I train for me now and I don't see that changing. So I will continue to go to the dojo as, as often as I can and continue to help the instructor teach as often as I can and help the growth of other students, because my passion is teaching regardless of whether it's drumming or whether it's, martial arts i just love to teach and so i'm happy to continue in that endeavor so that leaves us with a a pretty big question kind of an obvious one do you think you'll ever open your own school you know i have thought of it in the past and my wife has often said you should and i've had other students when i was in my breaks say you you should open your own school you'd be great you'd be a great instructor and, and school owner I don't know. It, is it possible? Sure. Do I see it right now? Mm, not right now. I hope you do. Something tells me you should. Now, if people want to connect with you or see what you got going on, maybe there are people listening saying, I want to learn bagpipe drumming. <laughs> <laughs> Weirder things have happened. I know we're laughing about it, but uh, some of the connections that have happened as a result of this show are mind-boggling and i love it so you know let, let's hear email social media websites any of that stuff you want to share sure well you can find me on facebook andrew adams there's a fair number of them but i'm usually either uh my profile picture is either me wearing a kilt or me wearing a gi 
So that's pretty easy to find. Uh, and then uh, if people want to email me, it's uh, andrew.adams.drums at gmail.com. Well, I appreciate being here today. Thanks for, for coming on and, and we got the chance to chat and I learned some stuff about you I didn't know. That's always fun. Absolutely. It was a blast. I had a great time. I appreciate uh, you having me on. I always enjoy getting to know my friends better. And what better way to get to know my martial arts friends than to bring them on the show? So thank you, Mr. Andrew Adams. He's probably rolling his eyes at me calling him that. For coming on the show, I appreciate all the work you do to help us out. And I look forward to getting to train with you again. Now, you can visit WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com to see show notes for this and for every other episode that we've ever done. And those notes include photos and videos, links, websites, social media, and more. Every single episode we've ever done is up there available for you. And if you're up for supporting us and the work that we're doing at WhistleKick, you have a few options. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off at WhistleKick.com. You could also share an episode leave a review somewhere, tell a friend, or contribute to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you have stuff you want to say, I'd love to hear it. If it's about an episode, please leave a comment under the episode at the show notes page. But if it's more general in nature, if you want to reach out to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And our social media, of course, is at whistlekick everywhere you could think of. I want to thank you for coming by today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>